And so, you know, if we love them but eat them and all, all these arguments that we use, if we love dogs so much, why do we let them end up this way? And if we can bridge the gap between loving certain animals and using others, we can start to overcome our cognitive dissonance and become more compassionate stewards of the earth. Uh, Michelle rescued Max when Max was just a baby, and Max runs around with her four big dogs and goes in the house and everything. It's pretty amazing. Again, with cognitive dissonance, we love elephants, but why do we enslave them for tourism? Why don't we just let them, you know, put them in a sanctuary if they need to be in captivity at all? And if we love dolphins so much, and so many of us do, why do we put them in a tank and swim with them? And actually, this, this place was crazy. It was in Hawaii. I was there this year photographing the, the swim with dolphins industry. And uh, to swim with the dolphins for 15 minutes in a group was $125. And they're making so much money off of these animals. And this picture kills me because you can see the rightful place of the dolphin in the ocean just beyond that lagoon. <clears throat> And this was shot for um, the marine land animal defense stuff that's going on right now. Speciesism, something else that we animals is talking about and looking at. Um, our assumption of human superiority, because we are quote unquote smarter than them. And I think this is a really great illustration of that. I don't think I need to explain. <laughs> so an antidote, one of the many antidotes for um, for our cognitive stuntedness <laughs> you know, about animals. Uh, sanctuaries. Sanctuaries are really, really great places um, because the animals there have been rescued from the farming industries, the fur industries, uh, the entertainment industries, and it gives people a different perspective on what kinds of relationships we can have with animals. People don't know that this kind of thing is possible. People are shocked by this image. Oh, I should... I should tell you what that is, though. So, um, Gene's the founder of, of Farm Sanctuary, the co-founder, and he rescued OP. This is OP. Um, OP was left on a dead pile behind a factory farm, and Gene was investigating, and he saw this living animal on a pile of dead animals, and he picked OP up, who was a six-week-old calf, put him in his car, and um, spent months nursing him back to health. And they remained really good friends for the 16 years that OP lived at Farm Sanctuary. <clears throat> Again, people don't know that this kind of relationship is possible. And once you open their eyes to that kind of thing, whether you're showing them pictures like this or you're actually bringing them to sanctuaries, um, it, it really changes people's hearts and minds. And I love this picture because there's not many places that a chicken or a rooster would be safe on a stove, <laughs> except at a sanctuary. <laughs> That's at Farm Sanctuary. So putting a face to the billions of animals we consume each year. It's really hard to feel empathy or understand a billion. I mean, even a hundred. It's hard to, hard to feel anything for a hundred chickens or a hundred cows. But show them pictures like this. These are two who were rescued. Um, they were meant to be food. Rosie on the left has a neurological disorder and can get around with the help of a wheelchair. And uh, Cinco de Mayo on the right, he's actually disabled as well. He um, had his feet amputated after he was rescued because he had serious gangrene. And, and they actually, these two disabled folks got together and they were boyfriend girlfriend for years. And it was funny because when I, I crouched down in the grass to photograph Rosie, he hopped over to me to like protect her. <laughs> it was really sweet. <laughs> and if we meet, <laughs> Dino, this is Dino at Farm Sanctuary, and he's the head. He, he just passed away, I'm sorry to say, but he was uh, the head of the herd at Farm Sanctuary. He was the welcoming committee. Phantasma, um, there's a film coming out about animal, animal rights, and about we animals. Um, the film is called The Ghosts in Our Machine. It's coming out in the spring, and she is one of the stars of the movie. This was the day that, uh, that she was rescued from... Uh, from the auction house. She had really long hoofs and um, distended bladder, and she was really, not bladder, um, she had mastitis, and um, she was really skinny. So she's only three years old here, but they were sending her to slaughter. Dairy cows can actually live, and I'm sure some of you in the room can correct me if I'm wrong, but up to 20 years if they're not, if their bodies aren't totally abused and exhausted. 
So uh, I wish that we could have told her in this moment that she was going to sanctuary and not to slaughter. She'd been, you know, pushed around all day and we got her at the last minute. She was worthless. Um, they were just going to make, you know, dog meat out of her. But Farm Sanctuary rescued her, uh, brought her to Cornell University, the, the vet school there. And it was so great because um, we were so tender with her when she was rescued and we spent hours with her afterwards and they did all this stuff to her and made her comfortable. And the next morning we went back first thing and this is the moment she saw us come in and she just started mooing and mooing and mooing at us like it went on and on and we really felt that she, <laughs> she recognized us and she was very happy and comfortable. It was great. And this is her now. Oh, well, this was, this was taken a year later um, with her best friend. Sonny is also one of the stars of the film. He um, was a day-old calf and he was very sickly. So again, he was, um, he was probably going to be sold for $5 or something. Uh, the farm rescued him and he just needed a blood transfusion. And, and then he was fine. So this is um, the next day getting his transfusion. And this is the big boy a year later, <laughs> or six months later, actually. So they're both at Farm Sanctuary and I encourage you to meet them. They're such... Um, they're such loving creatures, especially Sunny, who's only ever known love. Fanny is still a bit uh, standoffish because she went through three years of, you know, not 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 being loved. But Sunny has always been loved, so you can climb all over him and kiss his face right in the face, and he loves it. <laughs> And the turkeys at Farm Sanctuary <laughs> um, at, at Thanksgiving, maybe some of you have been there for the Thanksgiving celebration, but they don't eat turkeys on Thanksgiving, they feed the turkeys. And I encourage you to go down and have a great time and enjoy that, that celebration. I include this picture as well because I love the care that they give to each individual. Uh, we get to other sanctuaries as well. It's not all about Farm Sanctuary. Um, I think I think her name is Grace, and anyone else would have just euthanized her because of her leg, but they gave her a prosthetic, and she does just fine, and she's lived with that prosthetic for years. Um, Okay, uh, the, he is a recent rescue. He fell off, uh, um, he's at Snooters, Snooters Sanctuary, and he fell off a transport truck and the right person picked him up and took him and made the right phone calls. And this was outside of Montreal. And then a series of cars met the next car, met the next car. Um, and we brought him the last leg of the way to, to Snooters. So here he is <laughs> being very cute. And this is Susan who runs, um, run snooters, and uh, this is the first moment where she's seeing Edgar. And then we brought him in the house, and he made himself very comfortable. And this is on that in that first hour where she adopted Edgar. He's a big guy. He's really friendly. And uh, again, people need to see pictures like this because they cannot believe that we can have this kind of relationship with farm animals. Edgar was named after this Edgar. This photo was taken. <laughs> this photograph was taken at Edgar's mission in Australia. Um, that's Pam, who started the sanctuary, and her first rescue ever was Edgar, this guy. And um, and it's it's kind of all connected because he works. This guy uh, Kyle works at Edgar's in Australia, and we were doing a tour of sanctuaries in Toronto. But anyway, you guys know this place. This is the Guelph Donkey Sanctuary. And it's so, so important for us to like, to not only go there and rejuvenate and feel good and, and, uh, but to bring people who don't get to spend time with animals. So some of you guys know these animals. <laughs> so it's Gabe and who's the pig? Ah, Gabe's the best. It's my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is at Cedar Row, which is nearby. Um, I encourage you all to visit and support Cedar Row. This is actually at Storybook Primate Sanctuary. <laughs> this is not a primate. <laughs> this is a very friendly, is it a llama or an alpaca? Llama, see? <laughs> Glad you guys are here. Oh yeah, well, Storybook adopted uh, the IKEA monkey, Darwin, recently. And again, about relationships. Um, I mean, in a way, it's really unnatural for us to have these close relationships with animals, but this is the situation we're in, and if we can rescue them, and if we can create connections, I know I'm like really harping on this, but I really want you all to bring people to sanctuaries. <laughs> ah. And this is at Wishing Well Sanctuary. There are so many great Ontario, Ontario sanctuaries, I encourage you to visit them. And one last picture. <laughs> Keebler! <laughs> Love him. <laughs>
Hmm. This is where I try not to lapse into my animal voices. <laughs> because then you will all. <laughs> OK, so we're going to jump continents now. Uh, so you met these guys earlier. Um, they're the poachers, who former poachers, who now desnare the forest. This was a program started by the Jane Goodall Institute. They went in um, to small t villages where chimpanzees were dying needlessly on the, with these snares. They were being trapped in snares. So they talked to the villagers and said, OK, how, like, how can we stop snaring and hunting and make sure that you guys are still thriving economically and you, know, you have the food you need? And uh, so they worked on programs with that. And JGI, uh, Jane Goodall Institute, eventually stepped out and just let these guys continue. And it's turned into a really thriving program where these guys go uh, to different villages and towns and talk about poaching and talk about why it's just unnecessary and, and pointless and killing far too many animals that are, would never even be eaten and are never even found anyway. Uh, so they go out about 10 hours a day and they find these are snares. This is his machete. And uh, I found one of the snares as well. Here it is. I got to take it home. And it's just, um, it's just bike wire. I don't know if that helps. You can see it there. But this stuff is totally deadly. They set them up with a loop so that anything that puts his or her arm through um, or walks through and tightens, that's it. It doesn't untighten. And the animals die there. And the chimpanzees, even a chimpanzee can get an arm caught in this and end up like maybe getting, um, like pulling the snare out of the ground, but then having this around the arm and then losing a limb and then losing their life from infection. This was a really sad example. Um, this is a beautiful little animal called a diker, and it's like half deer, half rabbit. I don't know how to describe these sweet little things. <laughs> But we could, um, we could hear uh, her screaming in the forest, and we thought, great, we can save this one. We know that there is a diker in a trap. And so we started you know, cutting our way through the bush until we found this diker who was still alive, but she had been half eaten by predators. So they actually, like these people who care so much, for these animals actually had to um, kill her to put her out of her misery. There was no, there was no saving her. But so many animals are caught in these traps and just left there because the, the snares are put everywhere. And it's thick, thick jungle. And they're, they're just tiny little wires, right? Like, it's really hard to find. So it's a really useless form of hunting. And like I said, it doesn't catch just the small animals, but it catches the, the chimpanzees as well. This was really neat. I got to go to one of their meetings. I, of course, couldn't understand a word they said. This is in Uganda. But um, this was three hours of arguing and discussion. And then they got a lot of these poachers uh, who came to the meeting to, to learn about this to sign on, um, sign on paper that they would no longer hunt in this way. And a lot of them can't write, so they use their fingerprint. And so they would come up one at a time and put ink on their, finger, on their thumb and fingerprint. So does this affect us? This is, you know, some people could say, well, this is just something over there. It has nothing to do with, with our reality. But it really does, because bushmeat is a huge, huge, huge industry, even here, especially there, but even here. Um, the stats are that $50 million per year uh, in cities like Toronto, Paris, London. If you know where to look for it, you can get a chimp, a chimp steak. You can get a gorilla hand to use it as an ashtray. It's really awful. So it is our business to know, to know this stuff, and it is our business to speak up against it. 